At a time when people dared to hope that peace was more than a political illusion, Northern Ireland plunged to its lowest depths. The Oma bomb didn't discriminate according to gender, class or creed. It even touched the unborn. 29 lives destroyed and hundreds maimed by Republican car bombers. With the peace process reaching the stage where tangible benefits must be shown if it's to retain credibility, the question now is whether the politicians can deliver. Since the Oma atrocity, the real IRA has been caught in a vice between universal outrage and stringent new security measures introduced on both sides of the border. Now the group has called what it says is a permanent ceasefire. Tonight, Spotlight examines the political repercussions of the Oma bombing and asks, has violent republicanism really been buried along with the innocent victims of Oma? It would be a tempting fate to say this was the end of violent republicanism. What it certainly is, is the end of any toleration or any, uh, even a, a attempt to understand the motivations of that type of violent republicanism. I don't think that anybody can, can be yet convinced that um, the IRA have given up violence for good. Now, until the Unionists are persuaded of that, I think it's going to be very difficult for um, David Trumbull to carry his party with him into the actual executive. Unless we can remove the causes of conflict, unless we take away the potential for further conflict, then there's always the danger that there will be people out there who will resort to the use of armed force. I would be very hopeful that they have seen the errors of their ways, but I'm afraid the full weight of the law is coming down on them anyway. There would have been no outcry in, in, on the intensity or size, but for the fact that the, a large number of the people who were wounded and killed were in fact Roman Catholics. At 10 past three on Saturday the 15th of August, the biggest challenge yet to the credibility of the peace process exploded with deadly effect. An indiscriminate bomb sacrificed the lives of innocent people in pursuit of a Republican dream which, for the people of Oma, became a living nightmare. As the scale of the carnage became apparent, the shockwaves spread far beyond the market town. The hope of the Belfast Agreement, designed to end such atrocities, lay in tatters. For Unionist opponents of the deal, it was evidence that the process cannot deliver peace. I certainly was glad that I uh, had taken up the no position because it had been very difficult meeting the ordinary uh, unionist on the street. Uh, you know, they have been saying to me, well, you agreed with these chaps getting out and you had agreed with um, uh, these chaps being in government because the average man on the ground, the average unionist does not distinguish between the various shades of, um, of republicanism, you know, whether it's IRA, real IRA, continuing IRA, they don't really distinguish between those different sections and to the average uh, unionist on the street they're all the one. But the reality within republicanism suggests otherwise. In the context of an evolving political environment, the Oma bombing represented an act of desperation. Barbaric, yes, but calculated as well. The bombing was a direct attack on the peace process and Sinn Féin's position within it. We effectively have a situation which has developed where a very tiny, uh, small number of people uh, do not support the, the Sinn Féin peace strategy. And I suppose by extension uh, have withdrawn whatever support they had for the group that you termed the provisional IRA. And uh, they have decided that instead of supporting the peace process as the IRA have done, this small unrepresentative group have decided for their own uh, reasons 
to destroy uh, the peace process. Since its birth last September, the real IRA has been steadily building up its capacity using car bombs, such as this one discovered south of the border, to carry on where the provisionals left off. Senior Republican sources believe the scale of the Oma atrocity has bought the Sinn Féin leadership time, but only if political movement can be guaranteed. Even then, there are concerns that for some, support for armed action will remain. They will have support because the two major objectives of the provisional movement, Brits out and a United Ireland, were not achieved after many years of struggle, as they would term it. Those two objectives have not been met. While the eyes of the world were focused on the breakneck pace of political developments, such as the first meeting of the Assembly, less attention was being paid to Republicans outside the process. Sinn Féin contemptuously referred to them as yesterday's men, but each new day revealed just how determined the dissidents were to destabilise the new structures. There's a stark alternative here. There always has been over this past 30 years. Either we have a continuation of this awful violence or we have a political process that works and that is made to work, that people can feel part of, that they can support and that they can look to for leadership. Those are the only two choices. The dissidents had made their choice long before the Good Friday Agreement was forged by targeting market towns at critical junctures in the peace process. First there was Market Hill, just before Sinn Féin entered the talks last September. Then it was the turn of Moira and Porta Down, in the respective constituencies of Geoffrey Donaldson and David Trimble, the standard bearers of the two divergent blocs within Ulster Unionism. In March, as Gerry Adams was welcomed back to the White House, two bombs were intercepted by Gardaí in County Louth. On the eve of the referendum, a bomb destroyed the heart of Newton Hamilton. And during the height of the Drum Cree crisis, a 1,400-pound bomb, destined for Port of Down or Armagh, was abandoned near the Moy. Van Bridge was next on the list, a return visit to test the nerve of the first Unionist leader since Brian Faulkner to reach an accommodation with nationalism. Of course it is. Uh, very important, all of us hold our nerve. Um, that was the uh, lesson, I suppose, of the talks. There were many times when the talks could have floundered, they didn't. But I think that people deep down realise that although there are problems and difficulties which we're going to face, ultimately there is no other way forward other than the way that the people have decided in Northern Ireland they should have, and that is to go down that road of the agreement towards an assembly, towards a north-south body, and all the other aspects which the people voted for in the referendum. There's no alternative. There is no alternative. I tried to fix it myself, but it was only worse when I... But it was the sheer scale of the carnage in Oma which has done most to jeopardise the strategy of the dissidents. After the dead were buried, the community came together to bury their divisions and to plead that violence must be a thing of the past. You hold me like a child to my frozen tears fall at your feet. You can have my heart if you don't mind broken. Let us leave our town centre today in friendship and with the sign of peace. Republican strategists realise an armed campaign can only continue if there is support for, or at best, ambivalence towards violence. After Oma, that's changed, especially when Republicans were among those killed by a group claiming to further their aspirations. Even this tiny small group must have enough intelligence to know and understand that they can have no prospect whatsoever of engaging in anything remotely uh, resembling a successful armed struggle as they would want it to be without the support of uh, the Republican people 
particularly uh, in the north, I can say without fear of contradiction that they do not have that support. In the Republic, more than 30,000 signed books of condolence in Dublin alone. With support for the peace agreement registering over 94% in the referendum, there was a palpable sense of betrayal. Remembrance services were well attended. People determined that their voice should be heard. Faced with such popular emotion, the Dublin government acted decisively, challenging the rhetoric of the dissidents head on. Sadly, one has to say this, a lot of people were ambivalent. Uh, they disassociated themselves from uh, the blood and the result of armed conflict, uh, but uh, in their hearts they harboured a view that it was a legitimate end and a legitimate aspiration. Uh, what is very clear now is that there has been a widespread uh, communal rejection uh, of uh, physical force as a way of, of achieving political ends and it's not before time. Dublin came to a standstill as Southerners made it clear there could be no sneaking regard for armed republicanism. The dissidents were left with little alternative. One former IRA man who now rejects violence but disagrees with Sinn Féin's direction says their position had become untenable. It does represent a school of thought within the Republican psyche, which has been with us for well over a century. It's a school which I have described as the Fenian dynamiters, people who are indifferent and unaware, unaware maybe more than anything else, of the futility of attempting to oppose the popular will. Now, having said that, I believe that this particular school of Fenian dynamiters, this, that, that trend is coming to an end. I think that is one of the major consequences of the Omar outrage, that that particular school of republicanism no longer has a constituency which will allow it to survive. Even before the excavators had moved in, Sinn Féin had embarked on yet another series of policy changes. First, Jerry Adams unequivocally condemned the bombing. Then he declared violence must be a thing of the past, overdone with and gone. Roadblocks were being swept away as Sinn Féin embarked on a new path. Sinn Féin is not at war with anyone. And our big difficulty, obviously, is that we have a situation where there are some people within the political leadership of unionism who are not prepared to accept that, who, who in their own minds have remained at war with the leadership of Sinn Féin over the last uh, four years. We have made our position very, very clear. Sinn Féin isn't at war with anybody. We're committed to the peace process. I think it's very important to understand the general message of non-violence and democracy which underpinned uh, the agreement itself. They're the words always used. They were the Mitchell principles. And what uh, Sinn Féin said, said last week, in a sense, encapsulated those principles. And that does mean that war is finished. Uh, we can get into all sorts of semantic difficulties about what precisely that word means and that word means, but it's pretty clear to me that the statement meant that the road that uh, Sinn Féin intends to pursue, as indeed do the other parties in, in the Assembly, is one of democracy and one of peace. Do you believe Mr Adams? I certainly do, and I have no reason to disbelieve him or, or, or anybody else um, in the Assembly when they make these very important statements. Likewise, the appointment of Martin McGuinness to the arms decommissioning body reflects the Sinn Féin leadership's belief that its constituency would accept further compromises in order to obtain political movement. There is a genuine sense of anger within the Republican heartlands that the bombers were prepared to sacrifice innocent people, including Republicans, in order to destabilize Sinn Féin. I would say that there are well-experienced veterans in the provisional movement straining at the leash to take these people out. They feel that they have for a long time, for more than a year, been humiliated, been insulted, have had it pushed up into their faces from these reactionaries to do something. They think and they thought that they could get away with this. And that's how far that they have gone. They've killed 28 people and severely injured scores of other people and they think that they may get away with it. I don't believe they will. I believe that the provisionals will move against them if they as much as even load a gun. In last week's Republican news, the IRA made its position clear, telling the dissidents to disband. This was followed up by direct warnings, which if acted upon would have jeopardised Sinn Féin's place in the talks. 
By calling it ceasefire now, the real IRA has strengthened Sinn Féin's position and reasserted the primacy of the provisionals. In my opinion, there's only one uh, IRA, and uh, that IRA has been a consistent force, if you like, uh, throughout the political life of the north of Ireland for the last uh, 30 years. Uh, it's an IRA that has uh, I seen the benefits and potential of a peace process. It's an IRA that has supported uh, the Sinn Féin uh, peace strategy. The OMA bomb has highlighted a more obvious problem for Sinn Féin in the longer term, its relationship with the RUC. The party is in no position to help the police find the bombers, knowing full well that could play into the hands of those within the Republican movement whose support for Sinn Féin's strategy remains on the margins. These things are extremely difficult to deal with. These are the most difficult issues at the present moment in time. If one of your constituents came to you and said, I have information about the people who planted the Oma bomb, what would you do? Well, uh, I would say on the, on the air that I have my own particular, well, I would have my own particular way of dealing with it, but I wouldn't be prepared to share it with yourself. How would you deal with it? Well, I'm not prepared to, uh, to go down that road with you on this programme, Kevin. But can you give us some indication as to what you mean? No, I've said what I've said and that's it. Just finally, can you understand the dilemma that Sinn Féin is in over this issue of policing? Well, um, I don't think that supporters of the RUC should be using this situation uh, to sustain themselves as a, as a discredited police force. They should not be using the OMA tragedy as some sort of lifeline for the RUC. But just who are the dissidents and how credible is the threat of further outrages? The political group closest to the real IRA is called the 32 County Sovereignty Movement. Its emergence coincided with an IRA convention in Guidor called by the former Quartermaster General of the IRA to reassert the primacy of the bomb and the Armalite over politics. The body of the IRA backed Sinn Féin and the dissidents split. It was fears of a sellout that exacerbated divisions. Don't forget, these people are in a state of desperation. They realize that the centuries-old conflict almost looks as if it's going to be resolved. They are more desperate than the people who stepped out in 1916, who were in a state of desperation because they felt that the last-ditch effort had to be made to preserve the quest for Irish national and cultural identity. They stepped out in that, in that lines in 1916, these people feel that all the effort, the old Republican tradition, now looks as if it is going to be lost forever. Not only do the dissidents believe that the demands for a British withdrawal in United Ireland have been shelved, they argue that signing up to a Stormont administration will destroy the entire Republican project, a view shared by some in the wider Republican movement who disagree with the dissidents' methods. Sinn Féin will find itself uh, becoming more involved day by day within the mechanisms of the parliamentary process within the Northern Irish state, in effect uh, participating and prolonging the existence of the, uh, with the existence of the state and the existence of the union between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. And that will in some ways effectively negate the Republican position, the Republican policy, which they have said is at the centre of their political values. I am an Irish Republican. Uh, I want to see an end to British rule in my country. I want to see a united Ireland. And I am working with all the means at my disposal and whatever intelligence I have to bring that about in a way in which we can achieve all of that without great suffering uh, inflicted on our people. The real IRA is made up of disaffected provisionals and new recruits not moulded so much by experiences in Northern Ireland but more by Republican doctrine. Typical was Ronan McLaughlin, claimed as the real IRA's first martyr after being shot by the Irish police during an attempted robbery in County Wicklow. The sovereignty movement gave the political cover at his funeral which had all the paramilitary trappings normally reserved for the mainstream IRA. Francie Mackey, the group's most high-profile representative from the North, 
castigated the Sinn Féin leadership. Ronan McLaughlin was a volunteer of Oakland Iron. On active service and carrying out instructions from his military leaders. Ronan McLaughlin died as he lived. A true Republican who believed that lasting peace in Ireland could only come about through the total disengagement of Britain from this country. But it was the presence of Bernadette Sands McKevitt, a sister of the late hunger striker Bobby Sands, which struck a more uncomfortable nerve for Sinn Féin. Her role in the sovereignty movement is seen as an attempt to deny the northern leadership its most important martyr. I think it's totally wrong for anybody, no matter who they are, to suggest that they know what Bobby Sands would have done. I don't know the answer to that. All that I do know is that Bobby Sands was a very uh, intelligent Irish Republican, very courageous Irish Republican. He was in prison with many, many colleagues. Many of those colleagues are now uh, on the streets of Belfast and in many other areas of the six counties. And almost all of them are supporting the Sinn Féin leadership. Bernadette Sands McKevitt's partner, Mickey McKevitt, seen here with the baseball cap, is a less prominent public figure, but no less dedicated to the aims of the sovereignty group. A Dundalk Republican who had until recently close connections to the highest levels of the mainstream Republican movement, he retains deep reservations about the wisdom of the Adams McGuinness strategy. The sovereignty movement refused to be interviewed, but say they'll continue to argue against the Sinn Féin strategy. This ideological split in republicanism is accompanied by deep personal rivalry. In spite of the real IRA ceasefire, some believe the potential for a further split and more violence remains. There are a number of extremely dangerous people who want to continue. And I have no doubt that those same people will try to rearm, regroup, reorganize and re-emerge in the future when there is a, a potential situation that will allow them to do so. They will do their homework. They will analyze this situation. These people are killers without mercy. What Jerry Adams and Mark McGuinness are discovering if the generals go without the army, then they're in a difficulty. And they cannot, and it's now proven, they cannot deliver the IRA. But Dublin and London clearly believe that the IRA has been delivered and is wedded to the peace process. This has made it much easier to sell the stringent security measures designed in part to shore up a nervous unionist electorate. Sinn Féin uh, has signed up to the Mitchell Principles. Uh, Sinn Féin uh, have embraced uh, a new democracy, have signed up to the historic compromise. Uh, and this compromise, this agreement which we all signed, reaches into the cause of their conflict and they have accepted that and the IRA uh, have voted to accept that as well. Uh, so for that reason these measures are specifically aimed at those people who have uh, decided to walk away from that peace strategy and have not accepted the compromise uh, which is envisaged uh, in the agreement. In spite of this latest ceasefire, it's the handling of that security response which could ultimately determine the fate of the real IRA. The most controversial part of the legislation allows suspects to be jailed on the word of a police officer. The extension of such powers to Northern Ireland has profound implications. Critics say the new measures amount to internment by another name and have the potential to repeat the mistakes of the 70s. To put powers like this in the hands of the RUC may be even more worrying than in the hands of the guards. Not that we have not had miscarriages of justice in the Republic before, but in a situation where you have a very polarised community and where you still have a lack of confidence in the RUC on the part of the nationalist community, there are dangers in providing the RUC with a power which could effectively lead to jailing on suspicion. That there would be very great fears that that would be misused. But the arrival of President Clinton, coupled with intense behind-the-scenes activity which ensured political momentum was injected into the process, have put such concerns in the background, at least for now. President Clinton reinforced the theme, calling the peace process a real opportunity to forget the past, calling on the local politicians 
to deliver on the agreement. You have agreed to bury the violence of the past. Now you have to build a peaceful and prosperous future. To the members of the assembly, you owe it to your country to nurture the best in your people by showing them the best in yourselves. Difficult, sometimes wrenching decisions lie ahead, but they must be made. And because you have agreed to share responsibility, whenever possible, you must try to act in concert, not conflict, to overcome obstacles, not create them, to rise above petty disputes, not fuel them. And to the people of Northern Ireland, I say, it is your will for peace, after all, that has brought your country to this moment of hope. Do not let it slip away. It will not come again in our lifetimes. With apologies to Mr. Yates, help them to prove that things can come together, that the center can hold. The impact of the Clinton visit, including his emotional visit to Oma, did spur on movement, a momentum which included yesterday's meeting at Stormont when David Trimble spoke to the party leaders, including Gerry Adams. Significant in the sense that we are trying to demonstrably indicate that we're trying to find a way forward to get a structure of government for Northern Ireland, but not significant in the sense that, it, oh, here's some meeting you hadn't anticipated. What is this about? It was known this meeting would take place. Just all that was not known was the particular day or time of the meeting. But privately, Ulster Unionists are conceding this represents the beginning of a dialogue between republicanism and unionism, no matter how tentative. The ending of the threat of violence, at least for now, is likely to add to the pressure for that engagement to deepen. The real test will come next week, when the parties meet again to begin the process of forming a power-sharing executive. The executive will not be set up until at, at least February, whenever it assumed responsibility. We have to, as yet, decide on the departments of government, so you can't even begin to think about an executive. But the short answer is decommissioning must be there before we participate in an executive in Northern Ireland. I think the big mistake that is made here is that people are inclined to view the decommissioning issue as one that only relates to uh, the guns of the IRA. Uh, and of course the people who are shouting loudest about the issue are the people who had no difficulty in uh, walking into the talks last September alongside political representatives of groupings like the Ulster Volunteer Force and uh, the UDA. And uh, if they didn't have such a big difficulty with it then, I think that it's, uh, it's a bit rich now to be attempting to use the issue in an attempt to block progress. The uh, agreement must be implemented. Without an executive, you cannot have an assembly. Without an assembly, you cannot have the North-South Council of Ministers. Without an executive, you cannot have the ministers to operate an, or, uh, operate an North-South body. And without that executive, you cannot have or operate the British Irish Council. So one is, it's interlocking, one is dependent on the other. And uh, the tragedy would be if, in effect, because of real uh, points of division, and many of which are, are imaginary and stage-managed, that in effect the entire process was retarded. As a traumatised community is left to grieve, the reality is sinking in for the politicians that the process has now reached a defining moment. In the glacial world of Northern Ireland politics, a thaw has taken place, but not enough to predict with any certainty that Oma will be the final watershed. Thank you all for the overwhelming support on the Trouble Land. Please do like and subscribe as it helps us to grow the channels and spread awareness on this terrible conflict. If you haven't already, make sure to check out our second channel, which deviates from mainstream documentaries and delves deeper into personal stories that have arisen from the conflict. Many thanks to all our Patreon members, 
If you haven't already, please do join for free. The link's in the description.